Behold, he comes with the clouds, and every eye will see him. Revelation 1, 7. Every eye will see him. That means there's nobody who won't know that he's come. Uh, how does this text rhyme with a secret rapture? There's a problem there, isn't there? You can't have a secret rapture and every eye will see him because there's nothing secret about that. For as lightning comes out of the east and shines even to the west, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. Matthew 24, 27. Anything secret about that? I don't think so. That's pretty visible. He will be universally visible when he comes. Now the Bible says he comes with the clouds. Now what does that mean? Does it mean he's coming when it's a rainy day? <laughs> who makes the clouds his chariot, who walketh upon the wings of the wind. Psalms 104 verse 3. Now we have to do some Hebrew parallelism here. So the clouds are his chariot. The chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of thousands of angels. The Lord is among them as in Sinai in the holy place. Psalm 68, 17. So what does Hebrew parallelism teach him? Jesus is going to come with the angels. So when he comes, he's going to come in glory with all his angels. And how many will see him? Every eye will see him as lightning from the east shines to the west, so shall be the coming of the Son of Man. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Matthew 24, 30. You see the picture? So this means Jesus is coming with his angels. That's what it means. And when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. 2 Thessalonians 1, 7. Matthew 25, 31. And when the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and how many of the angels? All the angels with him, then shall he sit on the throne of his glory. So when Jesus comes, all the angels are with him. How many remain in heaven? None. They're all coming to the earth. That is zillions upon zillions upon zillions of angels. Unbelievable sight. Wow, it's going to be something. And when he comes in his own glory, and the glory of the Father, and of the holy angels. What does that tell you? Can you imagine the glory of the Father? Jesus is going to come with the glory of the Father. Now, if nobody can look upon God and live when he's sinful, what do you think this is going to do to people that have refused to give up sin? It's going to be a problem. And what about those who have been redeemed? What is their only hope of surviving the event? Jesus. To be covered by his righteousness is the only hope that there is. So he's going to come with the full glory of the Godhead and all the angels with him. And the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. Revelation 5.11. It's going to be a spectacular event when Jesus comes. Acts 1 verse 11. Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, who is taken up from you into heaven, will come in the way you have seen him going into heaven. So how was he taken up? Also with angels. They watched it. They saw him go up. And that same Jesus is going to come back. Not some ghost. The one who said, come, put your hands here and put them in my side and see that I'm real. This is a real Jesus who's coming back. The second coming will also be audible. 1 Thessalonians 4.16 For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God. 
everybody will hear it. Second coming will be audible. He shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the heavens to the other. Matthew twenty four thirty one. So who's going to gather God's people? Is there anything secret or quiet about this? No. So it's going to be a very spectacular event and all the elect will be gathered from all the corners. Now here's a very important criteria. He will not touch the earth. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. So there's a resurrection of the dead, but it's the resurrection of those who are in Christ. They rise. Then we which are still alive, so the living that are in Christ at that time, remain, shall be caught up together with them, the dead that were in Christ and the living that are in Christ, will be caught up together with them in the clouds, which means who? The angels that have just gathered them all. And what are the angels going to do with them? To meet the Lord in the air. Ah, that's a rapture, but it's not a secret rapture. It's a very loud rapture. And so we shall we ever be with the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. We must read the verses carefully. So when Jesus comes, every eye will see him. He will not touch the ground. He will send his angels to gather the elect. The voice of God raises the righteous in Christ, only then, and they're all gathered, and then the angels take them up and they meet the Lord in the air. He does not touch this earth. So when you hear that Jesus is here or there or in the inner room, what did Jesus say? Don't go. Don't bother. It's not me. Matthew 24, 26, 27, Therefore, if they shall say to you, Behold, he's in the desert, do not go out. Behold, he's in the secret rooms. Do not believe it. It's pretty simple not to believe it if you know the truth, right? For as the lightning comes out of the east and shines even to the west, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. Matthew 24, 26, 27. It's very plain. The Bible makes no bones about it. Nobody should have to make a mistake on this. Now, this is another tricky one. What will take place at the second coming? What does the world teach? Everybody will be converted. Everything will be honky-dory. The Bible hasn't said anything like that up to now. The resurrection of the righteous. That's one of the things that takes place when Jesus comes. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. The dead rise. Those in Christ. Revelation 25, 6 will tell us about the others. The rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. So when do the rest of the dead rise? Obviously a thousand years later. Is that what the text says, yes or no? Okay. So there are two resurrections. The one resurrection is the resurrection of the just. The other one will be a resurrection of the unrighteous. But the, between the two, how long? A thousand years. Is that what the world teaches out there? No. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. That makes sense. Which resurrection, if you are dead, would you like to be in? Obviously the first one. The second one could be kind of problematic. So we want to be in the first resurrection. Revelation 25 and 6. Who is in the first resurrection? Those who are in Christ. Simple as that. So the righteous living, what happens to them? They're obviously not raised from the dead. They are still waiting. And we could be part of that group, you know that? What happens to them? Well, 1 Corinthians 15, 52, 53, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, that's the same time when Jesus comes, for the trumpet shall sound, we've heard about that, the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be 
changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So there's a change. Everything that is mortal disappears. If you have fillings in your teeth, then watch out for anyone else because they'll just shoot up and you'll get a new set. Everything will be changed. And nothing will die anymore. That'll be fantastic. What happens else? Philippians 3, 20 and 21. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, in case you thought we were so cool, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. Wow! That is amazing. God will give us a body like his own. Amazing. This is incredible stuff. Matthew 13, 49 and 50. So shall it be at the end of the world. The angels shall come forth, sever the wicked from amongst the just, and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Well, the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman and every freeman hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. So there are two categories on this earth when Jesus comes. The one group is saying, this is our God, we have waited for him. The angels go, collect them, and what do they do with them? Take them up, and they meet the Lord in the air. And the others, what are they doing? They're running for their lives and hiding wherever they can. And who are they? Well, it looks like the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and all these people that are now saying they're going to be the winners. It looks like they're going to be in trouble. And said to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath has come and who shall be able to stand? Revelation six fifteen and 17. So they'd rather have a mountain fall on them than face the Lord. That's pretty serious. You ever thought of that? Mountain rather than face the Lord? Well, what else happens to them? And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth rejoice because the Lord is going to restore this earth and there will be a millennium of peace forever and ever and no more troubles. No, it doesn't say that. It doesn't say that at all. Matthew twenty four thirty. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. They're going to be happy. They're going to be very happy. Behold, the Lord came with ten thousands of his holy ones to do what? Execute judgment upon all. And to convict all the ungodly of all their works of ungodliness, which they have ungodly wrought, and of all the hard things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. In this series, we have called it the total onslaughts. Against whom? Against Jesus. Have we looked at some of the ungodly things they have said about him? Well, there's a day of judgment coming for them. And they might think they are the winners, but this text says otherwise. Jews 14 and 15 says they're in trouble. They're going to be convicted. There's going to be a judgment. There's nothing to be happy about. There's no conversion here. There is a judgment, an executive judgment. The great day of the Lord is near, is near, and hasteth greatly even the voice of the day of the Lord. The mighty men shall cry there bitterly. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, Zephaniah 1, 14 and 15. Who teaches this in the world? Have you ever heard this doctrine preached in a church? Never. Nobody preaches it. But that's what the Bible says. All you have to do is read it. 2 Thessalonians 2, 8. And then the lawless one, the one who changes the law of God, will be revealed. What happens to him? What happens to the one who dared to change God's law and says, I'm above the Bible, I can do it. Who cares? I can change the precepts of Christ. What happens to him? Let's see. 
whom the Lord shall consume with the breath of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. 2 Thessalonians 2.8. This is tough. Tough medicine. Really tough. So he might have a loud mouth now, but he's not going to have a loud mouth for very long. Jeremiah 25.33, And the slain of the Lord shall be at that day, that's always pertaining to the second coming, whether you read it in the Old Testament or the New Testament, there's perfect harmony. From the slain at that day will be from one end of the earth to the other end of the earth. They shall not be mourned, nor gathered, nor buried. They shall be as dung on the ground. Jeremiah 25, 33. Why will they not be gathered? There's nobody to gather them. Why will they not be buried? There's nobody to bury them. Where are those that could perhaps bury them? They're gone. And not secretly either. Is it biblical so far? I'm just reading the Bible. I will utterly consume all things from off the land, says the Lord. I will consume man and beast. I will consume the fowls of the heaven and of the fishes of the sea and the stumbling blocks with the wicked and I will cut off man from off the land, says the Lord. Did the animals sin? Why is the Lord going to destroy all the animals as well? You see, the animals, through sin, are suffering. And the animals have become degraded and diseased. If you look into your paleontology, you will find that the animals were huge in the past. Everything was much, much bigger than today. I bet you no dog ever got hip displacement. I don't think animals suffered then as they suffer now. In his mercy, God is going to end this entire creation. So what is going to be left on this earth that's alive when Jesus comes? Nothing except something, but I'll come to that in a moment. So everything is going to be destroyed. Does that sound like the story that is being preached in the world out there? No. Right, Psalms 110. The Lord is at your right hand and he will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. He will execute judgment among the nations, filling them with corpses. He will shatter chiefs over the wide earth. Psalms 110, 5 and 6. So what's going to happen to all these people that had such loud mouths against him? They're going to die. They're going to die. Jeremiah 4, 23 to 8. I beheld the earth, and indeed it was without form and void, and the heavens, and they had no light. I beheld the mountains, and indeed they trembled, and all the hills moved back and forth. I beheld indeed there was no man, and all the birds of the heaven had fled. Is there harmony between the prophets? Yes or no? <coughs> Absolutely. And I beheld, and indeed, the fruitful land was a wilderness. And how many of the cities? All its cities were broken down at the presence of the Lord by his fierce anger. For thus says the Lord, the whole land shall be desolate, yet I will not make a full end. For this shall the earth mourn, and the heavens above be black. Because I have spoken, I have purposed, and I will not relent, nor will I turn back from it. So although everything is killed here, it's not over yet. There's still more to come. Lots of interesting things are going to happen and we have to unravel it. So now, the secret rapture. Matthew 24, 38 to 42. As, for as in the days of the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving into marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. They will all be taken away as we saw. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken, the other left. Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. This is the text that they use to substantiate the secret rapture. Where does it say one will be taken secretly and the other one will be left? Does it say that? No. All it says one will be taken one will be left. In other words, the righteous one, what will happen to him? 
Angels will gather him and take him what? To meet the Lord in the air. The unrighteous one, what happens to him? He has to remain here and be dead. That's it. There's no secret rapture here. Is there any disharmony between this and what we've read? No. Dispensationalists claim that Antichrist will arise after the secret rapture. But the Bible clearly teaches that this power will arise from the church, not after the church. 1 John 2, 18 and 19, Little children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard, that the Antichrist is coming. Even now, many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For they had been of us, they would have continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. So, if dispensationalism teaches that the Antichrist will come in the future and he will come not from the Christians but from another society that will persecute the Jews, that is what they claim, that's not biblical. It's not biblical. And in any case, the Antichrist doesn't come in the future. He arose, as we saw, in Roman times already. He comes out of the fourth beast. He comes out of Rome. So dispensationalism cannot be right, it cannot be, because it's not biblical. But you know that the, virtually the entire Pentecostal world and the Baptist world teaches this. It's not biblical. There is no second chance gospel. The secret rapture teaches a second chance gospel. It teaches that those who are sinful will get another chance. And as it is appointed unto men once to die... But after this, the judgment. There's no second chance. Hebrews 9.27 You decide now or never. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God and he will abundantly pardon. Isaiah 55.7 There is no multiple choice here. The just and the wicked revealed at the same time. God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you and give relief to you who are troubled, and to us as well. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. Is there any second chance here, yes or no? No. So the secret rapture, is it biblical, yes or no? Decide from the text. There it is, very simple. The Bible cannot lie to itself. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Matthew 13 and 30, verse 30. Is that secret? Is that a secret rapture with a second chance? Yes or no? No. Everything happens when the Lord comes. So virtually the entire Protestant world is teaching a Jesuit doctrine. Alcazar and Ribera, futurism, preterism. Both started by Jesuits, both being taught in the Protestant world, it's not biblical, it's a lie, blatantly, to dupe people into not obeying the precepts of, word, of God. The secret rapture, God's people, those who have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb have to go through the tribulation. They are not raptured before it. Question. Were the Israelites raptured away when the plagues fell, yes or no? No. They were there and they saw a difference between them and the other. And then they were taken away and what happened to Pharaoh and his army? He was destroyed. That's a typology. It's a little enactment of a greater reality at the end of time. Then one of the elders answered saying to me, Who are these arrayed in white robes? And where did they come from? And I said to them, Sir, you know. So he said to me, These are the ones who came out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. They have to go through the tribulation. They're not spared the tribulation. The secret rapture or the rapture theory teaches that Christians will be spared the tribulation, will be taken away. It's not biblical. You have to be here. In that day they will say, surely this is our God, we trusted in him, he saved us, 
This is the Lord, we trusted in him, let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. Two groups, the one wailing, the other one rejoicing. Isaiah 25 verse 9. So there is no secret rapture, there is a glorious coming of the Lord, and there is a destruction of the living wicked, the living dead. Uh, <laughs> stay dead. That's not actually a bad way to say it, right? Uh, the dead that died in sin stay dead. For how long? A thousand years. 